While on the one hand it's quite clear that um, Keir Starmer's new cabinet or cabinet reshuffled, his opposition cabinet, is getting ready for election rather than seeing itself permanently as an opposition. How do we know this? Because of the reintroduction of former uh, cabinet ministers, real cabinet ministers like Hilary Benn and Pat, M Pat McFadden into the reshuffled opposition cabinet into the shadow cabinet. So we know that Starmer is getting ready. We also know that in the first meeting, Sue Gray was on the side taking notes. Things felt different, we're told. And Starmer warned his colleagues against complacency. Uh, not a single vote has been cast, he said. You know, you can't assume that simply because the Conservative Party are in such disarray that the mantle of government, government will be handed directly to the opposition. You can't automatically assume that, but I think it is inevitable the opposition in this country and the UK does not win an election. The government loses it, and the government has all but lost authority. People are no longer taking the government seriously. People are not listening to the Conservatives. Uh, investors in the city are beginning to invest in the Labour Party because there is a general assumption that the next uh, government will be a Labour government. I haven't seen that assumption so clearly um, understood since 1979, when there was an assumption that the next government would be Conservative under Mrs Thatcher. There was that assumption in the winter of discontent. It was the it was the first uh, election that I really knew, uh, that, that I voted in. And it, it was, there was an obvious feeling in the wind. And it, I don't remember it being like that during the Blair landslide or in the run-up to that at all. Uh, this is the first time since then that there's been a whiff of the obviousness. And uh, in contrast to Labour's getting ready for election, the Conservatives are simply getting on with business as usual, uh, trying, to, um, uh, trying to bail out a leaky boat. The autumn statement, uh, trying to um, put a new spin, uh, a new political initiative on the old frame. And again, even though that's going to take place on November the 22nd, even though there are calls for tax cuts, it's nothing new. Sunak is going to go to the G20 in India this week. The Conservatives' annual conference is coming up in Manchester in early October. And the first King's speech to Parliament will take place on November the 7th. All of this is very significant. But none of this feels like it's being orchestrated by a government that really knows what it's doing. The, uh, the concrete problem, where concrete answers must be provided in today's Prime Minister's questions, the Cabinet meeting that took place on Tuesday yesterday was, quote, obviously subdued. And the... Uh, and today, in Prime Minister's questions, you would have expected, I think, for uh, Gillian Keegan to be sitting next to the Prime Minister so that she was on hand to provide uh, concrete reassurance. But no, it was Chris Heaton-Harris. Chris Heaton-Harris is the only sure pair of hands that uh, the Prime Minister can look to. And if I had been Prime Minister, I would have appointed him to the Home Office, to Defence to the Foreign Office. He is the only person who is not carrying around baggage, personality baggage, or baggage from a previous ministry. It's extraordinary because he was Chief Whip. Uh, he's a person who has handled really difficult ministerial briefs, but he's done so relatively well. And even though the Northern Ireland brief has not yielded success, his part of it has been dramatically positive. He has, he has played his hand very well. Now, I think he is the only person who could command 
the house with or on for whom the house would actually listen and to whom the house would respond i think rishi is talking in the wind i think his chancellor is just playing uh, mo- mo- moving things around a board i think there is very little hope um in the other ministries well, how could there be suella braverman this is a laugh really a laugh if the stakes were not so high she has moved uh something which is a political hot potato the migrant problem uh she has moved pretty patel's solution into some sort of stratospheric obsession which comes close to xenophobia uh pretty patel's solution i think was wrong and suella braverman and the prime minister seem to be clinging to it in the hope that somehow it can turn out right how can something which is immoral how can something which is politically inept how can something which um is legally questionable turn out right the more chance there is the longer we give for this nonsense to play out the more chance there is that the legal problems that she is going to envelop the next government in will simply be bigger and bigger and bigger will almost be insurmountable they will cost the country so much uh we will be tied up in legislation for years to come because of her stupidity because it's not that um uh i i fully understand that there's a that there's a question about whether or not we are in control of our own borders okay fine i don't mind that but we do it by incrementally dealing with the issues the first issue should be the international uh laws that bind us those international laws and that means looking at the 1951 um refugee convention and we are bound not only by the words on in the convention itself but by the rulings of our judges over the last 40 years and our judges have made it very clear that although migrants should seek refuge in the first available safe country uh we have interpreted that as meaning that uh, they should make an appeal for asylum when they get to the first available safe country or when they get to the country that they judge to be suitable so there is an element of of judgment here made by the migrant and that is how case history a legal case history has interpreted that um convention and we have done it we have led the way in defining the way to interpret that and we've also made it very clear that about 70 days um freedom is allowed to travel through other countries before um settling on the place where one wishes to claim asylum otherwise of course otherwise there is an unreasonable um pressure put on countries in the south of europe like greece italy spain who are then expected to take all the refugees that's where the dublin convention came in to try and um sort out what what was going on and to allow people to return uh, refugees who had um already passed through safe countries in europe but that the dublin convention we left now if we had um the foresight to have negotiated some form of uh participation in the dublin convention we probably could have avoided the migrant rush to our shores but we didn't we were stupid we were led by people like fox and co who were so hell bent on their ideology they didn't think of the impact of dublin 3 and the absence of dublin 3 so we need to if 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 we need to um redefine the 1951 refugee convention that needs to be done internationally and i've been calling for this for a long time and there are people who will comment and and, and quote the uh, 1951 refugee convention 
um, verbatim and tell me that I'm wrong. But they should also be quoting the case histories from the 1990s and, uh, and before that make it very clear. Uh, and they should also be in mind, they should keep in mind the fact that we are no longer part of the Dublin Convention and therefore we cannot assume that simply because somebody passes through Europe they should automatically uh, claim asylum in the first safe European country on which they land. Equally, we no longer have access to the database. Uh, again, another stupidity which puts us at a disadvantage. Now we can say that Europe has not played fair in the Brexit fallout. Well, that was partly our fault. So, yes, before we, before we put in position, before we put in place the sort of laws that Suella Braverman has already enacted, the Nationality and Borders Law and the Illegal Migration Law, before we, did, before we do that, we needed to fix the, our relationship with the 1951 Refugee Convention. Our relationship with the European Court of Human Rights is an entirely different matter, uh, as again, we were instrumental in setting that up. And it's hardly a matter of foreign judges making pronouncements about things in Britain, as some of those judges are British. And we were part of the establishment of the ECHR. So again, we're listening to ideological propaganda from people who haven't done their homework. We can see that Suella Brabman doesn't do her homework because of the way she is leafing through her files during the select committee hearings. She doesn't know what she's talking about because she hasn't read her brief. That is shameless. Shameless. And she holds one of the key ministries of state. Now, the other day, yesterday, we were listening to the Prime Minister, and what struck me listening to the Prime Minister and to Gillian Keegan was how they were both singing from the same hymn sheet, how they were both using the same uh, terms. Exactly. Mitigation. Uh, a term which is so extraordinary to hear two ministers, uh, the Prime Minister and uh, some sort of poodle, using the same terminology. There's a, there's a script that ministers are supposed to stick to. This script is like a series of slogans which must be followed. In fact, I know this because various ministers who have spoken to me have told me about the various slogans that they are expected to pick up and use, the terminology they must use. And some of them rather resent that. Some of them take it on board. But I think we've got to get to a point where the sloganising stops and real thought, real work takes over. So, although the Labour Party is getting ready for government, the present Conservative Party is labouring through what it's already been doing and is seeing nothing change. And I think it's it's looking over the precipice. 